of Faith in a Base podcast, 055, Baptize Them. As we continue our mini-series about the Great Commission, we now examine Jesus' third command to baptize them. But before we get into this lesson, I want to give you a little show note about this series. This five-part series about the Great Commission springs from my original audio podcast series, which can be found at my blog. That's the site I always reference at the end of each lesson, a faithatabase.org slash blog. The original audio podcast of this lesson is number 55, so that's why I'm labeling my video podcast with the exact same number used in the original blog podcast. My hope is that I will eventually get around to reproducing all of the audio podcasts in video form, so I wanted to glue them all together with your original numbers, even though they're not actually online yet. So, you may not know there are currently over 70 lessons and videos posted at my blog. I hope you'll check them out. On the blog, these lessons about the Great Commission immediately follow a very deep and thorough 40 lesson series about water baptism. I cover every side of this age-old argument. So in this lesson about baptism in our Great Commission series, we could not possibly present the massive amount of material I cover in those lessons, but I will offer a solid overview, which may make this lesson a little bit long. If you want that deeper comprehensive study about the subject of water baptism, start with Lesson 12, The Proponents, where I explain both sides of the debate and how they're presented and carefully walk you through all the common objections and arguments from both sides. Having that foundational material will help you understand this lesson better. So let's begin. Lesson 55, The Great Commission, Baptize Them. If the first command, go, was the most challenging of our four crisp commands because it demands that we must be evangelistic, and the second command to make disciples takes the most elbow grease, I think the command to baptize is probably the most contentious. It is around this command some of the most intense theological debates rage. Some people believe water baptism is required for salvation. Others claim it is not. Some see baptism as a form of works a person makes to be saved, and this is in conflict with their belief that we're saved by faith alone. Others see the clear command to baptize, but they believe baptism is just something you should do after you are saved. Well, hopefully by the end of this lesson, we'll have a much greater clarity about this issue and gain some new and hopefully surprising insights. As we've already established, baptism is the third command of the Great Commission, and at the risk of belaboring the point, I will once again, and for the benefit of newcomers, remind us, since it is a command, it is not optional on our part. It must be obeyed by both the baptizer and the one being baptized. In other words, as a person who makes disciples, I have no choice in the matter. I must baptize my student. The command to baptize is explicitly demanded of me, the disciple maker. I don't have the right ability or authority to change it. It's what Jesus told us to do. Likewise, my student has no choice in the matter. That is, if they want to be a disciple of this particular master, Jesus. I think this is pretty obvious and easy to understand. Baptism is a command and it must be obeyed. But what is baptism and how does the Bible explain its administration and effects? You know, most churches today, from Catholics to Baptists, conservative and liberal, perform a ritual they call baptism in or with water. What does all this mean and what do the scriptures say? The Greek word translated baptize means to dunk, plunge, overwhelm, or immerse. This word does not mean sprinkle or pour water on someone or something. Baptism is the complete immersion in water performed on us by another person. Water baptism is the only biblically prescribed way a person can respond to the gospel message. It's not a human invention or work. God created it. So what happens, biblically speaking, to a person in water baptism? Let's take a couple of minutes and create a clear presentation using the scriptures. First, we are obeying the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Second, we are only saved after we believe and are baptized. Believe and baptism are linked in Mark 16, 16. Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. 
This passage says two things must happen for salvation, belief and baptism. These two things are inextricably linked with that conjunction and. So both must be true for the conclusion to be true. Just think about it. Who would be baptized if they did not believe? That makes no sense. Third, baptism is a point in time when we receive the forgiveness of sins and the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38 Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Fourth, we have not accepted the gospel until we are baptized. Baptism is how we accept the message. Acts 2.41 Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. A lot of folks talk about accepting Christ, but according to Acts, baptism is the only proof of that acceptance. Fifth, baptism is when our sins are washed away. It's how we call on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, 16. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized. Wash your sins away, calling on his name. Six, baptism is when and how we join Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And it is the exact point in time we begin our new life in Christ, Romans 6, 3-4. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Seventh, at the exact same time of our baptism in water, we are being baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. This is the only way we can harmonize Paul's claim that there is only one baptism. There is only one baptism, but two things are happening. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Number eight. Baptism is our faith in action and the point in time we clothe ourselves with Christ. It is the only way a person gets into Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Number nine. Baptism is when Christ performs a circumcision of the heart, casts off sin, and raises us with Christ through our faith into a new life. Colossians 2, 11 and 12. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. Finally, number 10. Baptism saves us. Just like the water of Noah's flood wiped away the sins of the disobedient world, our sins are wiped away when we are obedient in baptism. It is how we pledge a clear conscience to God. It's not a human work. It's the power of Christ's resurrection that saves us. 1 Peter 3.21 And this water, the water of the flood, symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So all these things happen at the time of our water baptism. Now, here's a little trick to help you if you're struggling to accept this concept. Take all the scriptures that we've just looked at and ask the inverse question about the claim the scripture makes. For example, what if I am not baptized? Will I be clothed with Christ? What if I'm not buried with Christ? Will I be raised with Christ? This can really help solidify your convictions on this issue. Now, let me speak for just a moment to the folks who have given their lives to Christ, maybe even many years ago, but were never taught that one must be baptized to be saved. God knows you made a serious and solid commitment and that you've kept your commitment faithfully for a very long time. God sees this. You're not running your race in vain. Many deeply dedicated folks believe that a person is saved when they first trust in Jesus. And for them, it's hard to accept this idea of salvation at the time of baptism. 
they reason that if they've been wrong about baptism, then their own conversion is incomplete. And the message that they've been presenting to others leaves their conversion as incomplete as well. It's this tension that leads to the debate. Both sides fight to be right. Both sides believe this doctrinal issue is a matter of salvation. So let's see if I can help you out. First of all, if you will humbly listen to the arguments and weigh carefully the reasoning behind them, as you are right now, you'll begin to see things in a new light. God will open your heart. Having failed to see the truth regarding baptism does not make you some kind of heretic. You just haven't seen or understood a particular biblical teaching. The very fact that you're hearing this message now is, I believe, proof of God's effort to reach you. You are on and have been on the exact perfect path God has chosen for you. And he's now ready to give you some new information. Dare we raise a protest with God and claim, hey, Lord, I don't think you know the best way to lead me to the truth. Now, on the other hand, if you find yourself emotionally shutting down and unwilling to listen to the scriptures, you have a more serious problem. First John 4, 6. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth from the spirit of falsehood. Now, if you have believed and taught an erroneous method of conversion, just stop teaching the wrong thing and start teaching the right thing. Listen, almost all denominations teach that when someone decides to follow Jesus, they must repent of their sin, right? People just can't continue in their sins and claim to be Christians, right? Some folks have to repent of things they have done. Other folks need to repent of things they have believed. You already know about Jesus and you already fight to live a righteous life. Now just accept this new revelation. Obey the truth and get yourself onto the right path. If you'll do this, I'll bet you just might become one of the most fruitful folks around. Let me explain why. If you can accept this new understanding and obey it, you will have a compelling new testimony. Not to mention a massive field of people who you can reach out to who already know, love, and trust you. You'll be able to humbly, gently, and lovingly go to them and tell them that you've recently come to some new understandings about some biblical issues which you've previously missed and want to share these things with them. There could be a bunch of open doors as you offer this new information with gentleness and respect. A lot of people may want to follow you as you follow Christ. This is what making disciples is all about. You know what? Probably 90% of the people you meet in a discipling ministry have all come from some other religious background. Talk to them. They have some great stories to tell. Well, I hope this helps you wrestle with this issue, but there's some other information which may help you even more. Let's get back to this command to baptize and dial it up a notch. Just like the first two commands of the Great Commission, this third command, the command to baptize, can be expressed as a complete sentence. The sentence contains a subject, the plural form of that implied you, meaning you all, specifically you apostles, the direct object of the sentence, them, is the who to baptize. So, the complete sentence would be, you baptize them. Now, here's where things get interesting, and I'm going to bet this is probably something that you never heard or thought about before. We understand who was to do the baptizing. It was initially done by the apostles who taught others to do it and so forth. We understand that baptism is an immersion in water, but when Jesus adds that little direct object, them, to the command, Something with significant ramifications occurs. Let's walk through this carefully. Who is this them? Who does them refer to? Well, the disciples the apostles are making. Remember, the process the apostles were told to follow was to go make disciples. So, before Jesus issues the command to baptize them, he's already defined the class of people them refers to. The apostles were told to baptize the disciples they were making. Think about what this means. This is a limiting qualification. Jesus super narrows the field of candidates who are eligible for baptism. This is stunning in its implications if you think about it. It certainly rules out infants, doesn't it? The only person who is a candidate for water baptism is a person who is becoming a disciple. This is extremely exclusive and certainly defines some of the guardrails of the narrow road. 
maybe we need to go back and think a bit deeper about the definition of a disciple from our last podcast. What is a disciple? Well, remember, a disciple is a student or a learner. They're someone who allows themselves to be trained by a disciple or a teacher. They are becoming like Christ. A disciple is someone who has begun to sincerely seek God. They're changing old behaviors. They become interested in reading their Bible and praying. These are some of the characteristics we would expect to see in a person who is committed to Christ. A disciple is not someone who simply believes in Jesus, but is making absolutely no effort to follow his commands. What we should expect to see in a serious seeker is a way of thinking called lordship. In today's churches, anyone can be baptized, even an infant who has no knowledge of God. The qualification for adult baptism in most churches is simply to believe in Christ. No serious commitment required. After all, we wouldn't want to scare you away by making you think you were committing a lifelong effort-filled obligation to the goals and operations of the Holy Spirit and our church. Most churches try to keep the entrance requirements pretty low. This is vastly different from first century Christianity. In the first century, people heard the gospel preached and they made a decision to follow Christ's teachings no matter where it might lead them. In some cases, it would lead to their persecution and death. This was not a hidden secret. The general public was aware of Christian persecution. So you can bet that subject came up at some level before anyone made a decision to become a Christian. I want us to think about this for a minute. In the first century, the consequences of your decision to become a Christian were dramatically different than they are today. It was not a decision made lightly. It could mean a death sentence. When you were in the process of becoming a disciple, you knew there was a cost to count. What would you do if persecution or even a little opposition broke out? Would you stick with Christ or would you abandon him to save your own skin? Becoming a Christian in the first century could be a dangerous decision. Now, even today, when someone wants to truly obey the gospel, the pressure is on. The vast majority of people who decide to follow the biblical plan of salvation must abandon not only their sin, but their erroneous beliefs. Remember when I told you religious traditions often die violent deaths? This can really stir up trouble in a family that has common religious traditions, which may go back generations. I've watched countless people on the verge of biblical obedience get shot down by family members and actually persecuted for wanting to repent of false doctrine. I have personally witnessed friends and family accused of being seduced by a cult and called names because they have come to the conclusion, based on the scriptures, that a person cannot become a Christian by saying a prayer or accepting Christ alone. I say all this to help us understand a disciple is something vastly different from someone who simply believes in Jesus and wants him as their best friend. Discipleship implies lordship. When we say Jesus is Lord, that means we become his slave and he becomes our master. In today's religious world, tons of people make Jesus savior, but very, very few make him Lord. Perhaps this issue of lordship speaks more clearly to the issue of who and who is not a disciple rather than baptism. Remember this from Romans, Romans 10 verse nine, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Lordship is a matter of salvation. This is something which really should be understood before baptism. When we say Jesus is Lord, we completely surrender our lives to the will of God and take on his mission as our mission. And that mission is the Great Commission. Without a Lord, we cannot have a Savior. When we're making disciples, I think we should have a very honest and very frank discussion about what it will cost the person before they make that eternal commitment to Christ. This is why there must be some modicum of a one-on-one relationship. When the church was new, there wasn't much need to count the costs of membership. People joined easily with just hearing a sermon before persecution broke out. While overt persecution is not a huge issue in most of the world today, we have another problem. Because of all the tenacious traditions surrounding Christian doctrines, it's my conviction that we should make sure people clearly understand what their commitment will mean for them in their own personal situation. 
We should hide nothing and be careful to make sure they understand what their personal costs will be and how they will be impacted by those issues. Remember, Jesus told us that we must count the cost of following him before we become a disciple. Luke 14, 29. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? First century converts understood the costs, and we should too. We must know with clarity what it really takes to become a disciple today. This is important because there's a level of seriousness and commitment missing from our modern message. This becomes so clear when we look at the attrition rate of the modern church. I've been told by my denominational minister friends that over 90% of the people who make a decision to join the church wind up leaving shortly after they make their commitment. I think there's probably two basic reasons for this. First, new converts are never taught what their responsibility and commitments will be before they join. They're never given an opportunity to count the cost of membership. When I'm making disciples, I would rather have someone be scared off, so to speak, by a commitment to Christ before they make that serious decision to say yes to Jesus, then live a powerless and hypocritical life. Now, think this second reason through. The second reason people give up so quickly on the church may be because they're never truly converted to begin with. Obedience to the gospel is a proper response to the message, and when there is a proper response, a scriptural response, we receive the Holy Spirit. People who do not obey the gospel correctly never receive the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit promised to all disciples. They live a powerless life, never completely freeing themselves from this sin that so easily entangles. This will obviously be super frustrating because they were told their lives would change. They don't change, so they quit, or worse, they become like the fellow who began to build a tower but never finished. Look what happens to this guy. Luke 14, 29. For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees him will ridicule him. This is one reason Christianity has become such a laughingstock. Great numbers of people buy into ineffective conversion methods and only survive for a short time. In the parable of the sower, Jesus spoke of four different types of soil. Only one soil produced a crop that multiplied. You know, we make a pretty big deal about the bad soils and blame the soil, or, or the person's heart in this case, for the failure. Bad soil might not be the real problem. One other aspect of this parable we completely miss is the fact that there also can be bad seed. An erroneous plan of salvation is bad seed. It cannot save. Good seed in good soil produces a good crop. So opposition and persecution for today's Christian can be a real thing, just as much as it was for our first century brothers and sisters. Listen to this. It's from 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. No matter the era, man is in love with his sin, and exposing sin brings wrath. Paul tells us if you want to live the kind of life which brings honor to God, you will be persecuted. You'll be mocked, insulted, abused, and maligned. It may not happen quickly, but it will happen. The world hates the light, and a true Christian is a beacon of light which challenges the sinful heart. We've got to be prepared. This is the life of a disciple, and the Bible tells us people should know what they're getting into before they make a decision to be baptized. Jesus' command from the Great Commission was to baptize the disciples which the apostles had just made. You see, it happening first on the day of Pentecost, and this pattern continues through the rest of the New Testament. When a person was ready to give up their old life and stop living for themselves and their own desires, they were immediately baptized by the person teaching them. There was not a moment's hesitation. There was no delay. You did not wait for a conveniently scheduled biannual baptism service. There's no baptism classes. So, these are the things we discover when we consider that little direct object, who. The effect of this limiting direct object, the who of baptism, forces us to evaluate the behavior of a person who is requesting baptism. It makes us ask, is this person acting like a disciple? Have I honestly prepared them for what could potentially come from their decision? If our answer is no, should we then baptize that individual? Probably not. And then, 
there's also the issue of their repentance. Can we as mere humans honestly evaluate someone's repentance? Well, I think so. By their fruit, you will know them, right? Let me illustrate. Let's say that you have just met a young man and he expresses an interest in becoming a Christian. He's heard about the message of Jesus and believes it. He's eager to follow Jesus and wants to be baptized. Would you, as an expert and careful kingdom builder, baptize him if he refused to stop doing drugs? Would you baptize him if he refused to stop sleeping with his girlfriend? Would you baptize him if he just refused to read his Bible for himself and, and commit to contributing to his own spiritual nourishment? Do you think these behaviors are things that are consistent with the word disciple? I don't. Absolutely not. You have not made a disciple. You've made a wimpy religious person with no convictions. The only person who is a candidate for baptism is a person who is, at minimum, in the process of becoming like Jesus to the best of their ability. This is seen in their behavior and in their language. While we can't evaluate the content of a heart, we can evaluate a person's behavior and language which spring from the heart. I think it's incumbent on a disciple of Christ to carefully consider the branch springing from the seed they've planted and not be too quick to move on to the obedience phase in the biblical plan of salvation, especially if it is clear a person is refusing to repent of sin and take on the Lordship of Christ. They must be able to stand in the waters of baptism and say with confirmed confidence, Jesus is Lord. I think we see this unrepentant attitude issue in the baptism of Simon the sorcerer. The scripture says Simon himself believed and was baptized, but Simon clearly never repented. Simon never made Jesus his Lord. He just continued in his lust for power and fame. This does not characterize the behavior of a true disciple. One could argue that it's not up to us to determine who should be baptized and who should not. Baptize everyone and let God sort out the bad hearts and false disciples. On the surface, that sounds pretty reasonable, but I feel like there's too many examples in the New Testament which express the importance of building carefully with great patience and careful instruction. When we baptize someone, we're making them members of the Lord's church, our, our home. They're required to conform their lives to the pattern of Scripture. We should be discerning and selective. Call us discriminating if you like, but our discrimination is based on spiritual qualities like repentance, righteous behavior, and godly language, not on worldly things like race, class, or gender. So the command to baptize has historically been a pretty contentious command, largely because the modern take on Luther's teachings is so misunderstood. Modern evangelicals claim faith alone saves us and point back to Luther as the author of that doctrine. So, if you're not convinced at this point, let me close with this information about Luther's position on baptism. Now remember, this salvation by faith alone belief is based on Martin Luther's teaching called sola fide, Latin for faith alone. Luther railed against the works-based merit system of the Catholic Church in the 1500s, which brought about the Reformation. Now let's not forget, Luther had been a good Catholic and absolutely agreed with the Nicene Creed statement, we believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. What we miss in the Reformers' teachings is that there was never an issue about baptism. It was the works-based, indulgence-driven teachings of the Catholic Church Luther was referencing when he speaks about faith alone. Even in Luther's own writings, he told us about water baptism. This is stunningly clear. Look at this. It's from a document called Luther's Small Catechism. What does baptism give or profit? Answer, it works forgiveness of sins, delivers from death and the devil, and gives eternal life to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God declare. Luther believed and taught Mark 16, 16 that if you believe and are baptized, you will be saved. 
Faith alone sprung from the grievances against the Catholic form of works-based salvation and security, not against baptism. The notion that baptism should be included as a work of man is a fairly recent invention and distorts Luther's message and intent. What the modern religious world sees as a two-legged stool of salvation based on grace and faith is pretty insecure. I see a three-legged and very stable stool based on grace, faith, and obedience. So, this is the third command of the Great Commission. Baptize them. I think most people are probably pretty clear on what baptism is, but perhaps we have never considered the inferred impact by that one little word, them. It narrows down the road, it defines an identity, it places boundaries and requirements upon entrance into the kingdom of God. It raises the bar of membership and it deepens our understanding that whoever wants to become a disciple of Jesus must have a faith that obeys. Well, thanks for listening and watching. Join the argument at www.faiththatobeys.org slash blog.